Stories of the Science Podcast with your girl and with an Hello everyone and guess what? We are about to wrap up season one of the podcast. Can you believe it? Today is our last episode, episode 48, with our official guest. Um, and I'm so excited because on the next two episodes and the following week, there's something pretty special to close it off. Um, so you just have to stick around and to see what it's all about. Remember that if you want to start your own podcast using Buzzsprout as your podcast host, is the best way to go. And there's a link in the show notes. So do check it out and also support the show. Today, my guest guest is Nkensani Mohale from South Africa, who is currently a lecturer of anatomy at the University of Pretoria. In this episode, we learned that she was fascinated by the human body when she was studying life sciences in high school. Naturally, she wanted to become a medical doctor, but unfortunately, it didn't work out. And instead, she went on to pursue medical sciences. There, she was exposed to subjects such as anatomy. Nkensani will explain how her journey was not an, a straight one and there were many windy roads also we learned that she became a mom in the process of her pursuing her various qualifications which also added to the load and she tells us how she navigated and um, struck that work home balance despite some of these bumps in this windy road Kinsani has thrived and has gained notable recognition in her field she tells us about the projects that she's currently working on focusing on the link between clinical anatomy and orthopedics so tune in to learn about all of this and so much more let's go hi Kinsani welcome to the show Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak uh, to you. So it's like really nice. It's an absolute pleasure. And um, I told you off air that you are officially my last official guest for this season. Yay. So I'm <laughs> so excited <laughs> to, to end off things with a bag. <laughs> oh, wow. I feel very special to be the one that closes off the series of amazing people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, so we're just going to get right into it. So please tell us um, a bit about yourself where you're from, where you're based, and what are you currently doing right now? Okay, so I was born in a small town. Well, it's not really a small town. It's like a location in the Northwest, Mututlung. So I was born there in 1985. And then when I was about 14, we relocated to another burbs because the parents were like, no, we need to get you out of there. So we relocated to orchards. <laughs> so family's been there ever since. Mom's been there. And then dad passed on in 2018, January. So, yeah, but I did my schooling in a primary school in Mutukung. So I then did my studies with the University of the Free State, then moved on to University of Pretoria, which is where I work now. Very, very mm. interesting. So um, you gave us a nice little a taste of what to expect in this interview. But before we get there, um, away from the sciences and away from you um, working and everything that you do in this field, I know that you are an avid reader. Do you mind telling us about one of the last books that you read, just to get to know you away from the sciences? Okay, so what I what I did when I when I was doing my last year of my PhD, hmm. I actually when I started my PhD, it's still I, I had still have a very long to do list of things that books I need to read. I started buying books that I wanted to read hmm. when I finished my PhD. So I have a whole stack of books that I still haven't gotten to. <laughs> but the other one that I wanted to also read was the year of the the year of Yes by Shonda Rhimes, which is oh, the last one that I read yes. that I managed to read and finish. Because there are two books that I'm currently reading, which, hey, it's not going so well. It's <laughs> working from home. And yeah, so I read The Year of Yes, which was such a brilliant read. And I think for me, because I, I could relate to so much of her story because of her what she calls and um, the, the the first only and what first only different you mm -hmm. know that she's done so many new groundbreaking things not that I've done too many new ground groundbreaking things but I could relate to sometimes being the only one in certain spaces you know mm -hmm. and and doing amazing work but also feeling this 
responsibility of caring not just you, but the whole, that you represent so many people who, if you fail, will either lock the opportunity for or block the opportunity for those coming behind you, or it will open everybody up to greater expectations of whoever comes after you, you know, Mm. or or make people more aware and more open to the idea of the other. Yeah. So I, 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 when I read that, I thought, oh my God, and it's brilliantly written. Mm. She writes it the way she writes her series. So it was like, it felt like talking to a friend who understands what you've been through and who's also shared the journey in their own space but the journey is quite similar which i i find that it, it's it's a common thread we spoke about it also just off a um you and i that mm. it, it's it seems to be a common thread with black women mm. that the struggle is different but it's the same in so many ways you know so i i think it was it was an interesting book i absolutely enjoyed it i couldn't put it down until i finished it and i also found there were so many nice quotes that I got from her, yeah. that, like things that I highlighted and now I use and then I sound smart. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm doing what I shouldn't do as a scientist, which is to plagiarize. plagiarize. But I do, I do cite, I do cite my sources. So um, I think I'm still safe, <laughs> but I, I found like quite so much wisdom in what she'd mm. written so, uh, that I was such a brilliant book. Oh, it sounds yeah. fantastic. I've actually it heard is, um, people rave about that. And I, no, and I it's think I it. should get my hands on that as well because I'm also trying to <laughs> get into reading um, as well mm. because I also used to be a reader but oh, science destroyed that love because of Yo, reading all these PhD. journal articles yeah because <laughs> you feel guilty that's yeah. what used to happen to me when I was doing my write up every time I picked up a book I'd feel so guilty and I thought you know what so my plan is I'll just buy the books that I want to read and just stack them so mm. now only now I'm trying to get through them oh, um, yeah. I love it and like you you said that there's just so much wisdom in reading, reading. Mm, mm, and it's almost like getting yeah. sort of like a cheat sheet um, in life. Yes, somebody, absolutely. When yeah. somebody has gone through these spaces and mm-hmm. then they kind of tell you how to navigate. And I think that's, that's the true. beauty of reading or also just getting firsthand experiences from people. You, you mentioned a little bit about growing up and where you, your humble beginnings. So I just want mm. us to revert back and to just kind of mm-hmm. understand, you know, the root of the sciences. How did you actually get into this field of sciences? And what were some of the influences? Was it something that you always knew that this is what you want to do? Or was it, you know, one of those accidental mistakes where you're like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> so what's your story? Okay, so mine is, my, my dad was a, was a pastor. Right? So he, he was one of those called by God, everything lived for God. Mm. But mm. also with that, my dad was an academic. So he, he was, when he passed away, he was actually, we were both doing our PhDs at the same time. And we had this thing of, we'll see who will finish first. Wow. And it's like, I, for me, it doesn't matter. I, I'm doing it because there's pressure to do it, but it's not a thing that I really, really want to do. But he was busy with his PhD. So I think the academic side comes from that because he always had the push yourself until you get to the absolute pinnacle of what you can get to. And then with my mom, my mom is a retired teacher now, retired math science and uh, what is it like? What they call it now? Life sciences, I think. Yeah, life sciences. Um, yeah. So she's a she's a, she's basically a math and science teacher. So you basically kind of have like those genetic advantages <laughs> in that sense. In that <laughs> math and science wasn't really something I struggled too much with. Yeah. So because of that, and then the academics is because of my dad. That yeah. So when when I finished high school when I was in in high school I always thought I knew I wanted to move into the sciences. I don't know what it is about it but I think for me life sciences was very interesting I thought the human body was absolutely fascinating so I've always had that fascination with the human body but because I knew I'm good at math science and life sciences it would be something in that particular stream so the option was between Um, being a medical doctor, which I thought is what I was going to be because, you know, when you're in high school, sometimes you don't know so much. The world is not as open as Mm. you, you would like it to be as, as it becomes after you matriculate and you move to varsity. So for me, medical sciences was medicine. So that was the first thing I was going to be a medical doctor. And then 
And then I applied. And then as medical school always goes, <laughs> not everybody gets accepted. And I think also my, my science marks didn't come out as great as I wanted them to. You know? oh, okay. So when they didn't accept me for medicine, I understood. I looked at them and I was like, okay, you know what? People are getting distinctions, six, seven distinctions. I get it. So, and then I got accept, I got accepted into um, Bimetsky. Well, University of the Pretoria, well, Pretoria calls it Bimetsky, but University of the Free State called it B a baccalaureus in medical science in human biology. Okay. So that's what I did. Yeah. So it was in the medical um, school as well, had all these anatomy, physiology, histology. So I decided, okay, I'll go into that. And then if I do like it, the worst that can happen is that I'll become a medical scientist. So mm. that's what I went to do. And I thought, you know what, when I started, I'm like, Ugh, you know what, I'll just keep applying to, to medical school as my marks improve in varsity. Yeah. And if they accept me, awesome. I still go into that. If they don't, at least I'm still somewhat in the sciences. So I applied for that. And in my second year, I stopped applying for medicine because I realized I fell in love with anatomy. So that's when we started doing human body dissections. And then you mm. start seeing the intricacies of the human body. And I think that's where my passion was was awakened and I was like okay this is it this is it this is what I want to do with my life so I finished and then when I in my last year I used to also work in the department just dissecting for them because they used to prepare um specimens to send to other universities that don't have um dissection halls so that mm-hmm. they can help um, teach their students so I was part of that and I used to sit there for hours and dissecting and finding all these structures which I should have found in my second year but didn't quite find <laughs> so now that I was working on my own and the, net, the knowledge was more embedded yeah it was okay it was a bit easier so then I did that and then when I finished when I, when I was about to leave and I was supposed to apply for my honors, I decided, you know what, I, I don't want to be in Bloom anymore. I want to come back home. So the people I worked with told me that there's a opportunity at the University of Johannesburg. They know the head of the department there and they would be willing to serve as like um, my, my referees if I need to contact her. Mm-hmm. And I should contact her and go work there as a, what they call a table doctor. So as like a demonstrator. So I called and then eventually they called me back and they said, no, we do have a position for you. And then I started there in February, 2008. So went there and then I didn't do my honors immediately because I thought, do I still want to do this? I was still sort of battling. I think that's, hey, some of us, the journey is not quite straight, eh? Yeah. So I, I think when I finished and then, because, and, and yeah, I think I was I was battling with a lot in my head of, is this still the place where I want to be? The money's not great because, you know, when you're starting, I think the fact that nobody warns you that, sort of like intern salary in Mm. inverted commas is not so great. It doesn't help with much except transport and maybe going out twice a month. That's it. You know, it was a bit like, oh my God, how did I go to varsity? And now this qualification is not giving me the life that I want, you know? Maybe it's it's a little bit of... To believe that you're going to get off the degree. That's the thing, you know, because you're like, but I've got the paper, but Mm. it's not translating into my bank account. So I stayed there and, and then I thought, you know what? My second option was always engineering. Let me, before I decide to pursue an honor, since I'm not sure about this thing anymore, let me start engineering on the with UNISA so that's what I did I applied for electrical engineering and I thought you know what I'll link up the the engineering and the anatomy because I know I still love anatomy the only thing is it's not going to give me the life that I want so I thought I'll do biomedical engineering eventually I'll link it up somehow I didn't know how but I thought you know what let me do the electrical bits because the anatomy is already sorted and Mm. somehow I don't know somebody will accept me and I'll do the modules that I still left and um when I started electrical I started I did it for one year and I thought "Uh -uh." uh-uh all this calculations I'm like I'm not bad at it I'm not failing it but I don't like it it doesn't give me the joy that anatomy does so then I went back to anatomy, applied for my honors, did that. Then I finished. And when I did my honors, I remembered why I fell in love with anatomy because I, I had to do research. So now I was working with um, neonatal um, population. So like with um, babies that passed away either just after being born or, you know. So I was doing a research related to that. A bit traumatic. It yeah. wasn't an easy one because, yeah, you you, uh, you have to shift your mind so much before you can mm. do that. But I kept telling myself, you know what, it's for 
for for the good of humanity <laughs> eventually it will be something worthwhile something worth looking at into and it contributes to medical research so i did that and then when i finished my honors the natural progression was to do my masters so i did my masters applied for my masters by then that's when i got married and then when i when i was in the first year of my masters fell pregnant with my daughter my mm-hmm. first daughter what do i do now do I continue or do I take a break? And then I decided, you know what, I'm just going to pause that year a bit and then continue the following year because I, I was struggling. The first trimester just hit me so hard. <laughs> I was like, you know what, I'm not getting anyway. So the yeah. following year, then I went back and then did my master's until I eventually finished. Yeah. Yeah. So we've gone to your master's. So now the PhD. Yes. Which... No, before the PhD. I told oh, you okay. my, my <laughs> winding road. It's been winding. <laughs> so with the... After the master's, then I, I still didn't have a permanent job before I finished it. When I started it, it, I still couldn't get a permanent job. And the UJ part-time thing wasn't working anymore because salary versus responsibilities and time. And and, yeah. and then I decided that, you know what, after six years of being at UJ, I'm going to resign and I'm going back to school full-time. So now this time the plan was I'll finish my master's because that's research. I can always do it while I'm doing something else. Mm. And then I'm going to apply for, to go into dentistry. So again, okay. it wasn't motivated by my love for anything. It was motivated <laughs> by money. Because I was like, I have a small child and I need to now start thinking like a parent, you know, this is not yielding money. And, and for, I think also because for the longest time during the period when just after I got my first degree Mm. to like the, the second year of my master's, there weren't a lot of anatomy posts in South African universities. You know, it was as though you needed to wait for somebody to either do a career change or maybe even pass on before the opportunity opened. And then I don't know, there was a shift with a lot of universities in that period. And then somewhat, I think maybe it, probably it was a demand from the government where they had the medical schools needed to take on more students. Then a lot of posts started opening. So there was a period where it was just basically a dry spell. So yeah, that, that was my frustration period. And mm. then when the post opened, I when I applied for dentistry at um, the now Sefako Mahato Health Sciences University, I also applied for the anatomy post there. So they rejected me for dentistry, but took me for lecturing, a lecturing post. So I went there and then eventually finished my master's and the anatomy always won, which is why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Which is yeah. definitely why you're here. I'm still at um, how you wanted to go into dentistry and you wanted to go into Yo. engineering. <laughs> and God was like, no, that is no, not your not, place. <laughs> that's not it. That's not that's it. Not it. Yeah, and I think it's probably also the motivation behind it because my plan was with dentistry, I would go in and I would be those dentists that put in gold teeth. Oh. And I would put my practice somewhere, <laughs> like gold teeth and denture, like anything that makes me a lot of money. Because my plan was maximum profit. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, anything I will discover when I'm in there, what makes the, the most money, and that's what I will explore. Yeah, and that's what I will then specialize in. But it, what, it had nothing to do with a love for it, no. It, yep. it really had nothing to do with that. Yeah. But yeah. So I'm glad that it didn't work out. <laughs> and here you are doing something that you're actually passionate about. Yes. And absolutely. Just, and I just love also in your journey, like you said, it wasn't straight. You had a child. Do you even as we're gonna learn on here, you've got two children amongst mm. all of this, um, two very beautiful girls. Um, and you still managed to do all of this. And I just yeah, and there's still so much more. But anyway, so um, I'm I'm gonna take it now to you um, to your PhD, right? And yes. initially, when we were speaking about the book and how you said that with Shonda Rhimes, um, you mm. related with with what she was saying in the book of the year, of saying yes, where mm. like being the first. Um, in in a particular field. And for your Mm. PhD, you were actually the first black clinical anatomy holder at the University of Pretoria. This is huge. And congratulations. Black female. Black Black female. female. Yeah. Not not black male. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah, black female, which is huge. So I wanted to ask you, um, you touched on it a bit earlier, but how did you um, navigate being a minority in that space um and you know knowing that you would be the first black female that that kind of push you to forge ahead um when times got tough 
Yeah, I, I think it does. But the, the other thing is when I when I initially started, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't mm. think of it and I wasn't aware of it. And I think with the being a minority, I, I, when I started in anatomy, it was very male dominated. Mm. There weren't a lot of females in the spaces that I worked in. It's since changed with the different institutions that I've moved to. Like now with, when I was at Medunsa and when I was at the university, now with the University of Pretoria, it's slightly different in that the male female ratio is, is sort of balanced. Oh, but cool. when I started at UJ and when I was also at the University of the Free State, it felt as though it was a very male driven and dominated field. So I've worked a lot with a lot of males as opposed to females. And and with that as well, that when you move into those spaces, you would also find that in the in academia, you would be one of the only black anything. You know, so the, the your other black counterparts are in the technical staff. So they, they are in, in technical positions. And in academia, you would either be the only one or one of two, but there weren't so many. So it's when I moved to UJ and I was still a demonstrator, it was the same thing. When I got there, I was the only black female who was an in inverted commerce academic, even though I was part-time employed. And the other black individuals were, were technical staff. So I thought, okay, okay, it's different. It feels a bit strange, but it's not bad. I can live with this because I, I think I know myself and I think I know what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. And my head of the department was very supportive. And, and maybe also because she was female, there were a lot of things that she was very sensitive to, you know? So it, it, was, it was a nice space to work in, very stressful because there was a lot to be done, but it was, it was a nice growth path for me. Mm. And I think maybe that's why I am where I am now because her work ethic was proper. She, she, was, she still is very hardworking. And then I moved from there to Medunsa. And when I got there, I also realized, ooh, I am black, and one of two academic staff members that are South African. And then there were other two black staff um, members that were not, natu- well, naturalized South Africans now. But then you move into that space as well and you realize, ooh, okay, not so many. Until Prof. Lebana, who is one of the, 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 the black academics that I found there, made me aware that you are actually the first black female anatomist that wow. has ever been hired at the, at the Sifako Mahato Health Sciences University. And I'm like, no, it can't be. And it's like, no, in the history of Medunsa, nobody of your kind has ever occupied an a lecturing post in this department. I'm like, okay. So I think that then you become a bit more aware and awakened and to that possibility. And But with that also comes a, a bit of a uh, some kind of stress because you feel mm. like you're carrying so much on your shoulders, you know? Yeah. You feel like you represent whoever will come after you. So if you mess it up, it messes up the, it skews the view for whoever comes after you, you know? So there was that. And then I stayed there for three and a half years and then I moved to University of Pretoria. So when I got to University of Pretoria, I also didn't realize that. So I got there and then because I there was a, a friend of mine, um, Dr. Shavalala, who was working there, he was the first black male academic to be employed in the department, the clinical anatomy section. Yeah. So when I got there, I found him and it didn't feel bizarre for me and it didn't feel totally unfamiliar because I, I knew him. So it was like, okay, you know, there's a friend here. So that, that, that's, that was quite nice. But, and then he's the one that made me aware of it. And he's like, um, you're the first black female <laughs> anatomy lecturer employed in the clinical anatomy section. And then you start thinking, oh, okay. Hmm. And then the now with the PhD, and then you're like, okay. Yeah. And I think now with the PhD, I also just wanted to, yeah, to to push myself and see if I can actually do this within record time, you mm. know, because I don't want it to go on for too long because it messed up with so many of my plans. I was like, do this, throw myself into it. It's going to stress me and then finish it, get it behind me because I feel like my life is on hold until this thing is done. Yeah. And then, yeah, then move on from there. Yeah. So it, it's now in hindsight that it's like, woo, the responsibility. And now I, I think I'm feeling the pressure to, to publish everything that I've done and to work even harder. You know, I don't always succeed at it because <laughs> balancing parenting, everything and everything, I have too many balls in the air. I don't always get it right, but I, yeah. I, I try, I try. I have a lot of things that uh, have fallen behind, which I need to get on course. But uh, yeah, it's it's a lot. It really is a lot. But it, it feels good. 
after after me, whoever comes after me, it's more uh, you know that it's possible, you know. And I mean, um, it this also transcends not only to the people close to you, but even for the people who you've probably never met and you'll never meet. But just knowing that there is a person who is doing that, who is able to do that, just creating those visible role models, like you say, just to know it's possible because, you know, how can you, you know, there's a saying where it's hard for you to imagine something that you don't know. So just the mere fact that you know it's possible, then you know, oh, okay, you can actually dream and you can actually Hmm. um, achieve it. So I absolutely commend you um, on that. And um, I'm going to ask you how you do it, actually, because like you said, you are a mom, you are a lecturer. You know, how do you hold all of these balls up in the air? Um, like you, you did say that sometimes it's hard, but like... I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know how I do it. I have the time I feel like I'm failing. <laughs> I feel like I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do because mm-hmm. I have a to-do list that's as long as the Nile River. <laughs> and it just, it doesn't feel like it's it's getting shorter. It feels like every day I get there and it's like, yo, 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 you know? So it, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. But somehow it gets done. It gets done. It gets it's just, done. it's it's not easy. It's very difficult. Half the time I'm very stressed, you know? And then mm-hmm. I have to calm myself down. Yeah, it gets done, but it's it's not easy. It it's you it, the the thing that you realize is there's a saying that I picked up from Oprah years mm-hmm. ago, and and I live by that, where she 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 was I can't remember what she was talking about, but in, in one of her her shows, she said, or oh, it was an interview possibly, where she said, nothing worth having happens without hard work, you know, and and now that the one that she likes using a lot is she says luck is opportunity meets preparation. Yeah. And I think that that's where I operate now where I'm like, okay, this is where I need to get to. This is what I need to do. These are the goals I have for myself. I might deviate from my targets every once in a while because I, I want to get the balance right. And I don't want my children to suffer because I want so many things, but if I can take them with me and do that with them, they all the more fantastic, you know? And yeah, it's, it doesn't always get done. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> but, but, but you realize that it, it has to be done. It has to be done. So I think now it's more, uh, I, I've gotten to with lockdown because now I had to be mom, lecturer, teacher, and so many other things. Now I, I do... I do what I can and I try not to be so hard on myself, mm. you know, mm. and, and, and I try to do the most urgent things first. And then the other ones, I'm like, I'll get to it on the weekend. It's fine. If I work seven days a week, it's fine. I will get to it when I get to it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So the urgent ones that I know, okay, if I don't get to this, there will be consequences. I do that quicker. And the other ones I'm like, you know what, it's, let me shelve it for later. I, I will try to do it. When my daughter eventually falls asleep at 11, I'll open my laptop and I'll do that. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, you guys are superheroes. Like, you're able to do all of this stuff. And some of us are crying when we are just soul people. So we we love we love to see it. Um, and just, just some of the, just to mention some of the things that are on your to-do list. You, you recently received a postdoc scholarship at Michigan State University, um, which is also another congratulations. Um, yeah, so you are a busy Thank bee. <laughs> as, um, <laughs> as the people will I'm a see. Like of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but then also, you know, is the current research that you're working on focuses on the link between clinical anatomy field and um, orthopedics. So I just wanted you... Um, to please explain a bit about the research that you're doing and why it is so important. Connection, it's more um, linking up the what you find in, in, in anatomy, so what you find with the anatomical research, so that it, it, it makes for better clinical outcomes in the surgical setting or in theater so mm-hmm. that you have outcomes as well. And that's what I'm, I'm happy about. So if my research can make even one surgeon think differently or even build on an idea, 
and then I'm, I'm absolutely happy. Yeah. Research sounds very interesting, right? But for somebody who's still um, a bit unsure, because it looks like you are doing medicine, but without actually doing medicine. So you said it does help inform the decisions in terms of these um, surgeons, for example, the orthopedic mm-hmm. surgeon. But what exactly... I don't know, what is exactly your role um, as the medical scientist to the mm-hmm. orthopedic surgeons? I think that's where um, um, I think it would be really nice to kind of differentiate um, for everybody. So what we do is normally the surgeons would approach us. So they in the they're in theater and then while they're working, they find, say, maybe a specific variation of a vessel that they don't know what it is, but somehow they severed it and then it, they had to have an emergency procedure because something went wrong. Okay. Right? And with that, then the surgeon sees that, okay, after the surgery, then they would find that possibly this is where this vessel came from. It's not documented anywhere. They've read scientific literature before they they opened the person up. They've looked at all the scans and whatever it is that they needed to prepare. Post-op, everything was done well, but somehow something went wrong. Mm. So the anatomy comes in in that we look at um, the the cadavers that we have, and you want to see if, say, maybe the issue is that particular vessel that is found in that specific area. There's There's a research project that one of my master's students is doing that is, 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 is linked to um, something that they call corona mortis caput, where severing of vessels that are in the pelvis, either during hip surgery or pelvic fracture repair, can actually lead to death because they sever the vessels because they're not aware that they will be linked up at that particular area. Mm-hmm. So now we're trying to map up to, to map out rather safe zones for doing that procedure so that they know if I go here, two centimeters there or one and a half centimeters that way, I could possibly encounter this vessel. But if I'm in this particular area, that is a, is a, is a safe zone. So I should be okay. And chances of severing anything are zero to none, right? So that's what we do. So we look at um, if the, the, the surgeon says, this is what I found, these, how, how, what is the frequency of it? Is it something that just happened once? Or, is, or did I, not that he imagined it, but did, did I cut something else and I thought it was something else? Mm. So we would then look at something like that. Mm. And then when we look at the anatomy behind it and then link it up with his clinical knowledge, then you're able to come up with the safe zones, for instance, like what we're doing for that particular study. Or what, they somet- what the, the orthopedic surgeons sometimes do is, okay, there's a specific, this is a, a new way that has been documented in Europe of repairing this particular area or in America or wherever in the world, they've come up with this new method of repairing this particular area. I've gone for training, but I'm not too confident about what the anatomy looks like in the South African population. Because you do find that when we do anatomical studies, we do find that some, some structures are especially vessels, they're region specific, that you might find the vessel is more common and it runs in this particular direction in the Turkish population, for instance, but in the South African context, it's slightly different Mm. in whether you're looking at the black or the white population or, or anything like that, right? So that's what we look at, that can I, he would then say, can I take their blueprint and apply it generically to our population or do I need to tweak here and there? before I say, this is the new way that I'm going, this is the new direction, this works, this doesn't work. And then he will then do, like with the Dr. Machiza that I work with um, quite a lot, he would then physically come in and perform a clinical simulation on the cadaver with the students there. And then he would then tell them, okay, dissect around this area and let's see what's there. Let's see if we're still safe. Let's see what we've damaged and things like that. So that's where anatomical research comes in, in most cases. So we, that's why it's important, especially with clinical anatomy, that's why mm. it's important that we work with the clinicians so that whatever research that you're doing, you want it to be applicable and to be relevant to them because otherwise it's useless. Yeah. And you, don't, you, you, can't, you can't work in isolation there. And then when you're done, you've, you've achieved all these amazing results. You have all this beautiful thoughts and all these beautiful pictures, but it doesn't serve a purpose. It doesn't serve anybody. Then it's useless and it's a waste of your time as well and a waste of resources. So mm. that, that's, that's where it links up. So in as much as I am not a medical doctor, right? So we do, that, we, we do the background work when required. 
Mm. Uh, when needed by the medical doctors. So then something like that, what we would then do is for things like conferences and presentations, you would then go and try and present as much as possible at orthopedic conferences. So we have our own anatomical society with our own presentations and there are different ones. There's one in South Africa, there's a Europe, European one, there's an American one and all the other ones where you would want to present. But also with that, because you're doing a link between an we also try as much as possible to present at South African orthopedic conferences. And if you can get to international ones and you have funding, ideally you'd also want to do that because you want to present this information to as large a spectrum of the clinicians that are working in that area as possible, that even though they don't end up using your, your, your recommendations or whatever, but it, it triggers something. And then it's like, oh, okay, no, maybe I'll look at this next time when I open up. I'll look at that next time I open up. Because you do find that when you're done, some of them will come to you and they'll ask you certain questions that, you know what, this is actually quite peculiar. I found one, two, three, four, five. I found three, four, six, five, six, seven. I wonder what that was. And then if you know what that anatomical explanation is, then you can kind of share the information. And then that's how you also establish collaboration projects with um, the different orthopedic surgeons as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's, it's you guys are very, very important, and um, that. Oh is, wow! <laughs> no, I think it's, it's it's true. You guys are doing like the the back the the, the back work, which is necessary, and I think um, all of this information, which all of these doctors need, so it's quite beautiful to see the synergy between um, mm. between these two disciplines. That it's not just one in isolation, like you mentioned, mm. um, and just. To kind of wrap up everything, this interview, you have a string of achievements. Um, most recently, you were named um, the Mail and Guardian Young. Uh, you, you were part of the Mail and Guardian um, Young South Africans list um, in the sector of education. Um, also, from that, you you were also um, awarded the first place of the Antoinette Kotsia Prize, the best time presenter at one of the congresses, the one that you've just spoken about. Um, you also awarded first place um, for the best postgraduate research paper. It's a lot. And like, this is just probably three of like the long list that I have. So just given where you are and all of these things that you've achieved that we touched on, what advice would you give to somebody who's interested in STEM as a whole, but more specifically in your field and where you are? I think the, what I've seen is it, you need to be patient with yourself. I think that's, for me, that's the lesson that I've learned along the way. Mm. S- structure your, your thoughts, structure your goals, know what you want. Because the, the thing that with academia as well is nobody's going to push you, you push yourself. And the nice thing about it is that it's one of those fields where we can all be at the top at the same time in that you can have a department with all professors and everybody's just doing their own thing and succeeding at it. There isn't a, a, a cap of, okay, we can only take so many professors. We can only take, we can only take so many PhDs and, and, and once you get in, you push yourself as far as you want to go. So you would then be your biggest motivator. Mm-hmm. But also you would, if, if you limit yourself, it, it is all on you, which I guess is, is in a way a fantastic thing about academia in South Africa, right? So you don't have too many stumbling blocks and everything is set out. If you want to achieve this milestone, there's, there's a, a paper that tells you you need to tick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, and ten boxes. But I also think it's important to link up with other researchers in as much as you may not, like with me, I don't actively have a mentor, but I have a lot of people that I can lean on and I get some kind of mentorship from every single one of them. So I, I know when I when I need this specific thing and I need guidance with this particular area, mm. this is the person that I go to. This is the person that I go to and this is the person that I go to. So that link up and that network across institutions, because our society is not, that there, there, there aren't a lot of anatomists in South Africa. So we're not so many. So you can actually end up knowing quite a lot of the people that are in the anatomy sector mm. or the anatomy field. So it's important to have those links that at conferences, try to network, try to speak to people so that you can form the collaborations. And also once you, with opportunities that you get, try to maximize them. Milk them as much as possible. Yeah. Milk them and, and don't also don't stop, don't stop tapping on doors, you know? And that's the other thing that I also learned that I should 
stop limiting myself and knock on doors if they're not if they don't open it's possibly not the door for you Mm. but sometimes you knock and you realize the door wasn't even closed it was just you know it was just pulled a bit and you you push it and then it it, it opens up and you realize this whole new opportunity so it's a don't 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 work in isolation ever ever Mm. even if it means you you become that in inverted commas that annoying person that when you're in the department or when you're when you're asked to do to do a certain thing, like uh, that's the other thing with academia. That the other thing is with most of these opportunities that will come your way, will not be paying gains. It's not things that will for you, mm. but they are building blocks towards a very successful academic career. So when you're asked to sit on this particular panel, when you're asked to supervise this, when you're asked to co-supervise that, and 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 try to say yes as much as possible. Of course, don't burn out, yeah. right? Because burnout is a real thing in academia. But try to open yourself up so that you can link up with as many people as possible. Because when opportunities come and when opportunities present themselves, because you are in people's radar, you're the first person they think of. Mm. So that that is very helpful. It, it's, yeah, don't always just make sure that you are visible. We not, it, science is no longer that thing where a person works in a basement somewhere and nobody knows about their work and they yeah. only know that, oh, there's this particular patent, but no, it, it's no longer like that. So when opportunities present themselves, um, rise up to the occasion and take them and take them. Um, of course, you must also know your strengths and your limits, but try as much as possible to take up those opportunities. Most of them will not yield any financial benefits, but it's it's good. Long term, it is good because academia is about so much more than money. Yeah. yeah. So if you found your passion, run with it, run with it. And always try to improve yourself. You know, you, 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 I think none of us, even with the professors in the department, when you speak to them, they tell you, oh, I don't know this thing. I still need to learn that. Oh, this time I was refining that particular area of my expertise. I was refining that. So never stop learning. Never, ever, ever, ever stop learning. Never stop improving your craft as well. And improving your craft sometimes means you go back to the same lecture and you realize, yo, by the way, I've been teaching this. Uh, 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 uh. Now I've listened to somebody else's lecture and I realize I've actually been making it too complicated. There's a simplified way of looking at this. There's a simplified way of opening students' views to the world, you know? And, and yeah, try to make it as interesting as possible for the students as well. Make it a pleasant experience for yourself and also for them because the energy that you feed to them, it always comes back. Yeah. You know, it always, I think that's the, the other thing that is beautiful and rewarding with what we do in that the feedback is almost immediate. All right. Sometimes you have to wait until the student graduates for some of them to come back and say, Oh, thank you, man. But some of them almost immediately, the the, the energy comes back, but what you throw out, you get back all the time. So it's fulfilling in that sense that you, your cup hardly ever goes empty. Every time it's sort of getting to the bottom and you give a little bit, you get a lot back. Oh, yeah. lovely. Thank you so much for all of those words. In the beginning, I feel like you were speaking to me. I needed to hear uh, <laughs> that particular part, especially about putting yourself out there and accepting all of yeah. these things. And, you know, so thank you. And I'm sure somebody somewhere also will resonate to all of the things that you said. And um, yeah, it was so lovely having you on the show. And what a beautiful way to close off. I knew that was a reason why you were thank number you so last much, day. <laughs> <laughs> What a beautiful way oh, to close wow. off. Thank you so no, much. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. It was so lovely talking to you. Yeah, no, I had a great time. And to everybody else who's listening, thank you so much for listening to the last official um, guest episode um, of the Root of the Science podcast for this season. And um, yeah, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.